you are on the journey of business. An entrepreneur and innovator who spent a lifetime of advising from behind the scenes, building businesses through word of mouth and referrals. Now Mike Wolf is ready to share these strategies and business outlook with you. You're here. You're ready for the journey of business with Mike Wolf. What's up, everybody? I am Mike Wolf, and welcome back to the journey of business. My guest today is a powerhouse in the entrepreneur education space who's teaching solopreneurs how to build their businesses. Welcome, Tammy Johnston, to the show. Thank you for having me, Mike. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Tammy, can you tell a little about yourself to everyone and so they can kind of introduce yourself? So, my clients named me the Hold Your Hand and Kick Your Ass Business Coach. Nice. I've been working with small businesses for over 20 years, and I specialize in working with solopreneurs as early in their journey as possible, like idea stage up to two years is where I can have the most positive impact. And I work on teaching them the basic foundational skills that they need to first survive the first two years and then go on to thrive. I'm on a mission to improve the dismal and unnecessary failure rate of new For businesses. sure. Yeah, that's what's up. Yeah. I, you know, we connected on social media where I did see you kicking the butts of solopreneurs, as, as you put it, a, as they kind of begin their journey in business. What does that experience with you look like when they bring you on board? Well, I work with them on going through my weekend small business class, which gives them the foundation pieces, all the stuff that the basics that they need to know, some of it they do. Everybody comes in with some strengths, stuff that they know that they don't know, but most importantly, opening up their eyes much faster to the stuff that they don't know that they don't know. Right. And then after we finish with small business class, then I take them through a year-long group coaching program where we continue to build on their knowledge. But most importantly we hold them accountable for doing the actions day in, day out, week in, week out, so that they actually make the changes. Because there's so many times you go and you take this great course and you're all motivated and that was wonderful. But the moment you get sucked back into regular everyday life, the phone's busy, the kids are need stuff, the dog just threw up, the cat's vomiting, and nothing changes. Yeah. Where, Kate, okay, we launch you, and then we actually hold your hand, love you and support you and kick your butt along right. the way to actually get you doing the things that you need to do. So that's awesome that you do that. So the holding your hand piece, I think, is important because you and I both know, you know, the first year is the hardest, right? You know, making your first amount of money is the hardest knowing, you know, all of the necessary steps, you know, from profit and loss to, to really kind of just easy foundational pieces that most people are unaware of. How do you find yourself adding value to those people? I know, you know, you do these courses, you know, you, you become invested in them, right? Yes. How hard is it to see people win or lose, right? Because, I mean, it's on them. Mm -hmm. and, and so how do you provide value to those people that are winning or losing in that season? Well, very much depends on, on where on where they are. The stuff that I've been I've been told is the fact that I'm a little bit on the scary side for some people. Sure. And they're going, there is no way in the world I'm going to risk not getting my stuff done because I told you I was going to do it. And I don't want you giving me those disappointed mom eyes. Yeah. So with a lot of the people, it's 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 the accountability, but I also work on very much a practical level. It's not theory. This is stuff that I've done personally that I've been working with clients for over two decades with. This is the stuff that works in the trenches because there's so many great things out there. Like you can get it through social media and you do all the courses, but it's such a high level. It's like, okay, if you have a perfect life so that you can implement this, then it's all great or an unlimited budget. I'm going, yeah, I've worked with bootstrappers. That's what I was when I started my business. Like, it's like, one of the best lessons I got is being broke when you start can actually be an incredible blessing because you have to right. work at it. You have to be creative. Right. And I know this sounds counterintuitive, but I've seen this many times. I've seen businesses destroyed because they started with too much money. Sure. 
And so their answer to everything was throw money at it. And that worked until they ran out of money. Right. Where the people that had to start and be very careful and creative, they found ways to survive. And then when things got better, then it was just awesome. But they could make it through the tough times. Right. Like I've been through three massive recessions in my 20 year career as, as, as a business person. Yes. In financial services, I've been through five. And everybody can hang out a shingle and, and, and succeed for a short term in the boom times. Can you make it through the bad times? Right. I think that's the hardest part for people. You know, they, they, I think they always see the sexiness of people winning. You know what I'm saying? So, like, they see the people on TikTok. They see the people on Instagram flexing. And, you know, hey, man, you know, spend seven bucks and I'll show you how to change the world. You know, it, it's 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 easy for people. You know, they they see that that's this generation today. I, I in my eyes, because I have two sixteen year old daughters that are constantly on social media. You know, it's like, look at so and so. He's flexing, and I'm like, he rented that car. You know, he rented that plane to take those pictures. You know, I mean, it, it, I'm trying to. Exp- and his parents are paying all of his bills. Right. And yeah. he hasn't. He's he's never been through any difficulty. And if he does, mom and dad will rescue him. Right. And they're showing you the highlight reel. You're getting the 30 second clip that they've curated for hours, if not days to show how perfect everything is when, yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Bullshit. Well, and, and I think that's, that's a tough lesson for a lot of people to learn. A lot of people don't want to hear that, that it's like, listen, you will fail. And when you fail, you better not have mm-hmm. all your eggs in one basket because if you do, you may not recover. Yep. And like you said, people people who do have a, a nest egg set aside to go in and they're all in and that's their space, chances are those are usually the people that aren't hungry enough to chase it, mm-hmm. in my opinion, that I run into, you know, because I get paid to, you know, similar to you, I get paid to yell at CEOs, which is awesome, right? But it's also, you know, you don't, you have to know the boundary of going, this is factual, here's how you're going to change it, here's how you fill the holes in the boat. And like, let's turn it around and here, you know, here, here's a game plan. You, you get to yell at the CEOs because number one, you know what you're doing, but the CEOs also have the strength to be able to take it. Yeah. They know that it's not always sunshine and roses and they need an outsider sure. to sometimes help us see the forest for the trees. Yeah, absolutely. We all, we all need that. Like I'm really good, but I have people that I talk to, like coaches that I work with that coach me and, yes. and some really good friends because sometimes when you're so deep in it, we can't see what is plain and simple to everybody else. Right. And that's another thing that I do a lot with my clients. It's not that they don't know, but they need somebody to talk to that that's safe to talk to. Because when you first start in business, and I found this out for myself and then with all my other clients, that your circle, your social circle changes. Yes. When When I first started my business, all of our friends were other employee types. Correct. Two years after, like we're still friends with them. A lot of them are still my clients, but we don't really socialize much anymore because it's like I'm speaking Greek and they're speaking English and we can't, we don't really understand one another anymore. Right. So I have other business owner friends and people in my circle that I'm going, okay, am, am I just having a blonde moment? And I can't see this. Like, what am I missing here? Right. And they understand. And I've been happily married for over 25 years now. I don't have business conversations with my husband because it would just stress him. Yes. <laughs> That's not his personality. It's not his skill set. He's wonderful in many other ways. Right. But I can't talk about my business with him. Sure. You say that a lot of my friends are business owners. It, it's a mindset thing, I think, more than anything. And, and I think being able to teach other people, you know, self-awareness is hard. And, you know, when you're, when you're in the weeds a little bit with business or you're winning in business, some people just can't, they can't correlate the two, you know, they they can't bring that together in their mindset to go, okay, man, he, he struggled or he's winning, but they didn't see you struggle, you know? And so it's such an interest. Or even when they do, oh my. Yeah. So I'll fill you in on this. So like I said, when I first started, started my business, all of our circle of friends that we spent a lot of time with, because it was all before we started having children. So we had time. Right. And my first two years in business were really challenging because I was insisting on doing it right, not just going out and making quick sales and stuff like that. And I went from having a regular job where you got paid every two weeks, you knew what was coming in and all of this stuff. And it was stressful and boring, but it was consistent to, I eat what I kill. 
And it takes a little while, especially when you're out to get your hunting skills up and things like that. And it was really stressful. So they went through that with us. And then after I hit the two year mark and I put things together and things were going so much better, they looked at me and like, you're so lucky. And I'm going, did you forget about all the crap I went through for two years? Like you were part of the journey, but they completely forget about all that. Now I'm lucky. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a different mindset is the only way I can put it because, you know, they, they see hard work and success as luck, right? They don't see it as the grind. They don't see you, you know, huddled up under your desk when things are terrible, you know, or or, (laughs) trying not to puke your guts out. (laughs) Sure. Or, or, you know, when times are tough financially or when you're, you know, you're doing everything morally and ethically, you know, right by people and it's not working. And, you know, it's just interesting that you say that because I mean, I, it's never something I really think about, but I do, it is about who you surround yourself with. And, you know, because you want people who are like-minded who have been where you're trying to go and you want to be able to drag some people who aren't where you are yet to where you are. And, and, and that's not saying anything bad. Like I said, I'm still friends sure. with those people. A lot of them are still my clients, yeah. but we just, we can't. And, and, and they're wonderful, kind, generous people, like not saying anything bad about them at all. But moving from an employee mindset to an entrepreneur mindset, it, it's night and day. Yeah, It's night and day. So it's just, they can't understand. That's it. They just can't understand. So let me ask you, because the, I'm, I'm always fascinated with this. You know, self-awareness is such a huge thing to me. Right. Like I knew very, very early on in the game, I grew up in a family business that I did not want to work with other people or for other people. Right. You know, you work for your parents and it's a nightmare. And, you know, what it did is it it taught me that entrepreneurial spirit. But I also knew immediately that that I wanted to do other things. And so what I did, you know, in my experience, and this is kind of where I want to touch on yours, because, you know, I, I wasn't fired or anything, but it was like, I was actually recruited to a a fortune 100 company Hmm. early, like early, early, like 22 years old. And it was like, Hey, we want you to take on this massive territory and be a regional manager for us. And it was a massive pay increase because, you know, you go from working for your family who don't think you're worth the money. Right. Let's be honest. They changed your diapers. Yeah. I mean, what, what, what are you worth? Fine. And then, (laughs) you know, and then, and then somebody values you for what you're worth. Now I went into that experience knowing that I had no interest in working in a corporate space, right? So what I did is I went in and, and kind of parlayed that experience that I had for a handful of years, learned the territory, learned more about the business, learned the customers, and then broke off and actually built my own business based on that, calling on the same people in the same industry, working within other companies. And so, you know, for you, like, what was your experience like self-awareness wise once you decided to dive headfirst into your business? That's a really, really good question. So I've been being pushed for years to start my own business. And I kept like holding myself back. I'm going, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm blonde. I'm female. I'm really young. And you want me to go into financial services and make sales? Like, yeah, no, thanks. <laughs> and then like I, said, I, got, I got fired from a job I absolutely hated. And I just started laughing because I'm going, it hit me at that moment going, I never have to work for another creepy incompetent old man again. Because I'd been, I had a very good reputation in the industry. Like one more week, I would have been to another position making more money and all this stuff. And thank goodness I was fired because otherwise I would, it would have taken me a few more years. Yeah. And when I got into it, I didn't have the family business or any like that. I worked through different companies and stuff like that. And I'm just going, I can do a better job than this. And I have no tolerance for stupid people. I, I'll deal with my own mistakes, but I hate having to take the garbage from other people's mistakes. And I'm being the dumping ground and I'm seeing all of these things that they're doing wrong. Right. And so I'm going, okay, yes, I, I can go and I can do this better. And it was a big eye opening experience because it was, you, you go through like literally highs and lows instantly. It's like, oh, this is wonderful. I'm in charge of my fate. Ah, oh, I'm in charge of my fate. Yeah. This is terrifying. Yeah. And, it, it is. It's like a motion sickness kind of setup, right? You, oh. you, you know, because you're you are on this kind of roller coaster of the highs and lows and getting paid and how you're going to get paid and, you know, taking care of people. And, and, and it's, you know, when I started my company in 2002, it, it was really something that was just born out of I had the relationships. I knew the knowledge of what I needed to do to win. And how can I help add value to the end user? That's all I cared about. And so I knew that it, the money would come if I would just go out and hustle like I had been hustling, you know? 
it, it's such an interesting experience that because I, I it is it's like a vertigo kind of motion sickness of going mm-hmm. man i'm not i i don't feel like i'm doing right and then you get a big order and you're like maybe i am you know it it, it is it's such an interesting experience so what would you say like your message is to your new clients, you know, as they're new to the game, right? As they're new to being an entrepreneur, you know, as they're, as they're kind of wading into the water a little bit, you know, and, and, and you're having to kind of not feed them with a fire hose, you know? Well, the, the big thing is number one, yes, you can do it. Yeah. It, it, it is possible. The other thing with it is yes, it's possible, but it's not an overnight success. Most overnight successes take 10 to 20 years. Right. Like you, you, you have to go through the slog. You have to put the time in day in, day out. And one of the things that I absolutely love about being in business is if, if you're bored, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yes. Like you and I both started our businesses back in, in, in 2002. We've been doing this for like coming up on 21 right. years. And I don't know about you. I can make a pretty educated guess. You're still learning things every day. And, the yeah. game is constantly changing and I'm going, there's all these opportunities and where do you want to be going? And if you are bored, you are not doing it right. You're hundred percent right. And it also comes down to who are you surrounding yourself with? Because no matter how brilliant you are, no matter how experienced, cause you and I are both, but there's always stuff that you're not going to see. You need to have good, honest people that are going to tell you the truth. Yes. They're going to love and support you, but they're going to tell you when you know what you're being an idiot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because if, if you don't listen, don't have those people to save you, you are still going to make your mistakes, but they're going to be a lot more painful. Yeah. I, I've always found people who surround themselves with yes, people never win. Oh, no. One way or another, they end up collapsing, you know, like, like a cheap tent. It, it just seems like mm-hmm. that every single time when somebody's like, well, I had the best people around me. Well, why were they good? Well, they would always tell me, you know, tell me things. And I'm like, no, they always told you what you wanted to hear. Yeah. They, they kept feeding you. I call them candy coated road apples. Yes. hundred. That's, that's good. Yes. Because like, it's, it's so, it's so important to surround yourself with good people, like you said. And, you know, when you're building a team, you know, I talked about this a handful of episodes ago, you know, when you're building your team, you've got to be able to trust the people around you. Right. But, you know, because to hire people that are smarter than you in places that you're not as smart is what I always tell people. And so if they can work, you know, on the business instead of in the business, it's a lot easier to maybe kind of give them that roadmap, if that makes sense. Oh, completely. So you mentioned to me when we were talking that your mission is to fix the failure rate of new businesses. What is the plan for that? Because I'm down for that. Well, the biggest thing, because like I said, this is my background. This is what I do. And it breaks my heart every time I see a new business fail. And most of the time it's not because there's a problem with their product or service. Yeah. And it's not because the owner isn't working hard enough. Those failures are the rarities. Most are failing for the simple fact that they lack the business skills to build around that product or service so it could survive. Right. Most people that start a business, they're technicians. They're technically very good at creating their product or providing their service. Sure. And they go, and, and then we have this build it and they will come horse hockey belief. Yeah. And they're going, all I have to do is provide a great product or service and all, that's what's needed. And they don't know anything about marketing. They don't know anything about creating systems. They don't know anything about who do you take your advice from? Yeah. Most people, like people will offer you advice and some of it is well-meaning, but there are people that are actually out there to cut you down. Are you getting advice from people who actually know what it is that they're talking about? Yes. Or your most people get their advice from their broke ass friends and family who have never played in your arena. Do they understand their financials? Like that's the number one thing that I have found that pretty much all entrepreneurs avoid. Unless there's like so much money in the bank account that they're excited to look, they don't want to pay any attention to their financials. Yeah. So they're not aware of what's coming in and what's going out. They're not learning the beautiful stories that their numbers are telling them <laughs> where they can go and help more people and make more money. Right. Another huge one because my background is financial services and I'll have a lot of accountants call me and going, I need you to kind of smack my client around right? because they've got payroll on Friday and it's Tuesday and they have no money in the account. Nice. And my first question is, tell me about how do you do your invoicing? And they usually go really red and well, we've been so busy. I haven't sent an invoice in three weeks. Yes. Well, that's why there's no money in your account or knowing the difference between 
profit and cash flow and how they both work yeah. and how you set up your, your habits. There's a lot of people, it's feast or famine. When they're in the mood, they will, they'll work 18 hours a day or 20 hours a day and then they get burnt out and then you can barely find them in the office. And it's, the, it's all of these little pieces. It's the basic business pieces that are irrelevant to product, service, industry, any of that. Right. It, it's, it's good that you say that because the number one issue that I run into when a client hires me, the first question I talk about is profit and loss. Always. Hey, we're making a ton of money. Cool. You know, or we're losing. Can you help me find the holes in the boat? Easy. And, and usually I can pick that apart, whether it's cost of goods or I can pick that apart. And, you know, I, I usually can find ways for people to trim fat, obviously. The hardest part that I usually run into is change. Change is always hard for people, especially established companies that just feel like, man, we're doing okay. Well, if, if you were doing okay, I wouldn't be here, you know? Um, so that's just kind of how I view it. I, it. It's probably a weird way to look at it. But, you know, I, I'm glad you said that because, you know, as a dad of daughters, I mentioned I have 16-year-old twin girls. I'm always teaching them how to be successful in business at, in, in whatever they face, right? Mm-hmm. As a woman, do you believe that the glass ceiling is still in effect in business? In the job area? Yes. Yeah. In business, it's still there, but it's an awful lot thinner and it's an awful lot easier to, to break through. I was going to ask, so how do you shatter that? Because, you know, I, I was raised, my mom grew up in an industry, in the hotel industry, for example. She worked her way up from the bottom all the way up to a national position with, with major chains. And she faced these daily battles of a, a male-dominated industry, right? Mm-hmm. And it was very interesting to watch from the sidelines. As you know, I have all women in my house other than the two dogs, which I don't know. It's weird. But, you know, uh, they... It, it, I want them to understand the importance, my daughters, of, of putting yourself out there, knowing that it's impossible, you know, it's not an impossible mission. And, and you know, so I, I wanted to get your opinion on that, because as a woman who's dominating in, in a great space, you know, you're based in Canada, but you work in the United States, you work internationally, right? Yep. And so as long as they speak English, because my Spanish is muy pequeño. Uh, uh, <laughs> that is outside of my pay range. But so <laughs> but, you know, I, I will say, you know, I'm always curious about that. So do you so do you think that it's possible to, you know, say somebody has a job today that they hate, that they're you know, that they're wildly talented, a woman, for example, mm-hmm. and they want to do something on their own, you know, and, and they don't have the faith or the confidence to jump out there and do that. And, and so what kind of encouragement would you give to that and let somebody know, like, if you're self-aware enough to know you need to work for someone and not work for yourself, here's some steps that you can take. Well, I've worked, I've worked with people like that, but like I said, my biggest thing is, okay, set, setting up your own business, even if you're just doing it on the side, like one, one of the reasons, like I said, when I got fired from my job that I hated, why it just instantly, I'm not, yeah, this is great. I'm going to start my own business because my husband and I were starting to, hard to talk about starting our family and I'm going, I don't want yeah. My daughter in daycare where I have to get her up at five o'clock in the morning so I could drop her off at daycare so I can get to work and miss like all the like her first words and her first steps and all of this stuff. And I, 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 that, I don't want to do that. So I want to have if I'm running my own business, I set up everything around my life. And that's what I did, because a couple months after I started my business, I got pregnant. And then I ended up taking 30 hours of mat leave. Like my daughter was seeing clients with me before she was two days old. Right. And we just kept going. And now she's in university. And that's, I was pizza mom. I would be able to do field trips. I was able to do all of those things. (laughs) Right. Having, Having the confidence. So if we want to talk about business and in corporate, and it's starting to be talked a lot more about and it seems to be a lot more intuitive when we're when we're training men men are taught to talk about how is this going to improve the bottom line how is this either going to make us money save us money or both yeah where women were taught well lean into it be a little bit more confident it's all about communication and women are not taught to look at the numbers right and the people that are mentoring men and women don't think about that and the women that are being mentored don't think about that so when it it's it's so painfully obvious. Sure. But when we do, so like I said, if you want to start blowing up that glass ceiling in a job in corporate, you need to start talking about the numbers. How is this going to help the bottom line? Make money, save money, or both. And that also completely relates back to your business. 
Like, yes, we want to help people and we want to be, but how is this going to make the money, the business money? How is this going to save the business money? And how is it going to, or better yet, do both? And if you're talking about sales, we make people feel empowered or it's going to do this. No, how is doing business with my company going to make you money? Right. Save you money. Like that stuff. We need to have those conversations. Sure. I think that's really good. You know, I've talked to them a lot about different stuff. They want to get into business. They love it. They've seen me do it their whole life. And so my requirements for them were, you're going to have to take some basic accounting classes and, you know, you're going to have to take some, you know, just, you know, basic business education classes that I think are important. I'll pay for it. That's not the problem. I want you to put yourself out there. If you want to, you know, one of my, I have one daughter who wants to open a bakery, but the funny thing is she wants to sleep till noon and doesn't want to get up at 3 a.m. to have to have stuff ready for people at six. So, you know, I mean, teenagers these days, you're teaching the work ethic a little bit, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's also like choose it, choosing your business. So, okay, if you if you don't want to get up until noon and you want to be more of the other stuff, well, then how are you going to have? Because you have to have somebody there that's putting this stuff in the oven at three o'clock yeah. in the morning. So partnerships. <laughs> yeah, it, it's definitely interesting. So, you know, just it, it, it's educational for, for me trying to show them because I can tell them, I can lead them, I can guide them, but I can't make them do it. So it's like. And you also have the wonderful advantage that your dad. Correct. And, and you are dad. And, and like, you know, it's so funny because I mean, I do catch a lot of respect from a lot of different people and they see that and, and that's awesome. And, and the show, for example, has come and, and it's taken off, which is such a blessing. And they see that and they hear that and they hear the feedback. So I'm, I'm really just trying to kind of find my way with them. You know, I've got a couple of years left with them before they would have to go to college. You know, I mentioned you know, you're in Canada and you and I kind of discussed you know, your daughters at university there in Canada, which they're, they're, it's far different there than it is in the United States. In some ways. Can you give me some example about how it differs? You know, I know things like student loan forgiveness and and things like that. Can, can you kind of break that down for me? Because I am really curious about that. Well, we do. We do have lots of different student loan forgiveness and stuff like that. And the big thing is that our, our student loans are not predatory. Okay. Where American student loans are like, oh my goodness, the stuff that I see about going, okay, I borrowed 46,000. I've been paying for 35 years. I've paid like 180,000 and I still owe 200,000. Right. That does not happen here. Sure. Like it is set up that yes, okay, you can borrow and it can very easily be paid back because it's not going to be predatory, which is which is huge. But then there's it's it's not just a, a U.S. thing or a Canada thing. There's a lot of pressure that we put on kids that in order to be successful, you have to go to college or university. Right. And I'm going sure that is not true. Yes. Like there's definitely certain things that they do. Like my daughter's going in to be a software engineer that she needs a degree for. Right. You want to be a doctor or an engineer or something like that or a lawyer. Yes. You have to go to school for that. Yeah. But I know so many people that went to college, university, they have degrees and they have never done anything with those degrees or they did something with their degree for like a short while. And now they're doing something totally and completely different. And you have the opportunity to do like trade schools. Like yeah. you want to do plumbing, you want to do mechanical, you want to do electrical, carpentry, all these stuff where you can you can learn on the job. And entrepreneurship is also a huge thing. Like now we're seeing so many people going into like the gig economy and doing like Uber driving and DoorDash and yeah. stuff like that. And I'm going, that's just a crappier job if you ask me. Right. But at least it gets you into the world. But step back and think, what do I actually want to do with the next step? of my life. Yeah. Because that's another thing. We're pushing kids to go, well, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Well, statistically, your daughters and mine are going to do seven total and complete career changes yes. before they're done their working life. We're not talking different companies. No, we're talking total and complete different career changes. Right. Here they offer vocational stuff in our high school, you know, where they can get to a two year education in pastry chef or cosmetology or whatever. I have one dot that both of them love makeup and hair, which is awesome, you know, but one wants to be a chef, the other one wants, you know, a pastry chef. She'd rather make desserts and do stuff like that, which is awesome. And I have another one that was like, you know, I think I'd like to do hair one day. Then the next day she wants to be a nurse. I don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I can't keep up. It, it just kind of depends on what that looks like. So, you know, I, I think that's so good. You know, I, I'm always curious of the differences of there versus here, because I, I do hear so many incredible things about university in Canada from a number of different professional people that I have talked to. So, you know, I, I definitely built my show, if you've heard it, I don't know if you have, on the return on investment of failure, right? And you and I kind of discussed that. It's so important for me 
to get the message out there that you are going to fail as an entrepreneur. It's no questions asked. Oh, absolutely. If you are not failing, you're not doing anything. Yeah. And you're not learning. So I think that that's, you know, people always come, man, you're winning or losing. I never look at it as losing. It's always learning, which is great. But I am fascinated by that return on investment. How is failing in your journey at all helped you or hurt you? Oh, absolutely. Like you're preaching to the choir. I absolutely love this. One of the things that I teach all my clients and I do this myself after everything, win, win, lose or draw. I always say, I want you to do an autopsy. What worked? What didn't? What do I want to try next time? Yeah. And I'm a huge fan of learning from failure. Like we definitely need to learn from ours, but I'm a yeah. huge fan of learning from other people's failures and mistakes. Yes. It's one of the reasons why I do my teaching and stuff. I'm going, this is all the stuff that I have learned the hard way, or I've seen my clients learn the hard way over the years. Here's how we can help you prevent, minimize, or just be prepared to deal with it when it does happen. Sure. So you can go on to make your own interesting mistakes. But if you're learning from them, and I'm going, there's so many times where I've gone through, and I look back at the beginning of my career, and I'm going, why did it take me so long to figure that out? Like, that's so painfully obvious. Yeah. But when you're in it, you can't, you can't see it. And there's some things that you are only going to learn by doing. Like you can read all the books, you can take all the courses, you can do all that stuff, but there are certain things that you could literally only learn by playing the game in the arena. And as long as you are paying attention and not just like, yeah, I don't, I don't acknowledge failure. I'm just going to brush it off. No, you need to acknowledge it. You need to, what am I learning here? Because I've also learned that the universe likes to present a lesson over and over and over again until we get it. Right. And each time we ignore the lesson, it gets more painful. Sure. Until the point sometimes when people give up, you know, and, and, and I think yeah, they're destroyed. Like, how bad is it? Like, can I recover from this? So I would rather learn with the small mistakes right. and get that lesson and move on rather than like, no, I, I only get it once you've like destroyed me. No, that's not a good point. And and I think that's the hardest part for people to kind of see up front when you know, nobody wants to lose. Right. You, we're, we're, we're conditioned early on in the game to never lose. Right. Whether it's athletics or it, or school or whatever it is, you know, I mean, which is a joke, but don't get me started on the school system stuff. <laughs> but people so badly want to win and they want to win. And what they don't understand is there's enough room for everybody to win. Whenever I hear people talk about that, I remember a movie I watched when I was a, a, a kid. So do you know Nadia Comaneci? Yes. Yeah, the first the the first female gymnast to get like a perfect ten and stuff like that. Right. So I watch. I was watching a movie on her life when I was I was quite young. She's a bit older than I am, and the one part of the movie that completely sticks out. I only saw the movie once, and this has got to be at least four years ago. Is when she was quite young, like seven or eight years old. Like she was the top of her class. Like she was the best. And so she was always used to being like, all the kids are looking up to her. And then there was another girl that came to her class and was way better than she was. Right. Like basically, like didn't mean to humiliate her, but her skills were so much better. Like she was, had her butt handed to her. Sure. So that, that would, that would be a great big, huge failure. And a lot of people would have like, well, I'm not top dog anymore, so I'm just going to go high. She took that as a motivator. Yeah. And that's what got her to the perfect tens and and being like she is still remembered 40 years later. Like she's the one that set the bar. Yeah. And the only reason that happened was because how she looked at the failure of having her butt handed to her by that other girl who was much better than she was. Right. And I think there's incredible power in those kind of lessons, honestly. Like, you know, you want to surround yourself with people who are winning. You always want to look at a roadmap of people you like and want to follow, for example, and you see and you hear their journey, you hear their lessons, you hear their failures in their eyes as lessons. You know, you learn from them so that you can avoid those pitfalls if possible. But to think it'll never happen is foolish. That's that's fool's gold. Yeah. So what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's considering, you know, starting a business or leaving a job, you know, that they hate to dive into something new? Well, like I said, I like getting them before they leave the job. Like I, 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 I get a lot of people that are hoping for the package or they're going, well, they're talking about doing some downsizing and I'm, I want to be one of those people because you get the package and stuff that's even better. Yeah. I'm going start 
putting your business together now. Like I'm going, if I could go back and talk to me one year before I started my business, yeah, the amount of time, money, pain, and grief, I would have saved myself going, this is the stuff that you need to start putting together. Sure. You need to start working with a, a good coach as soon as possible. And what I mean by a good coach is somebody that can help you where you are right now. Right. One of the things I see, and it drives me nuts, and I get all the advertising stuff through social media, and there's these coaches, and they're offering these great and expensive programs, and they're offering them to everyone. Yeah. And I'm going, not appropriate, because if you have somebody who's just starting out at baby steps, and you're a coach that's like paying Usain Bolt level, yeah, that's a disconnect. It, 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 it's a lose-lose. You need somebody who's going to help you where you are. Yes. Help you figure out what your what skills you have, what skills you're lacking. Hold your feet to the fire because when we have a job, we have all that external stuff that keeps us going. We have a boss, we have we have to be there at certain times. When you are an entrepreneur, you are in charge of everything, which is a blessing yeah. and a curse. And a curse. <laughs> for sure. Yes. No, that, that's so good. You know, you know, wrapping up, like what kind of stuff would you, that, you know, did we not cover that you would like to cover that, that you feel like is, is just an internal flame for you that, that you'd like to throw out there? Oh, well, there's, there's so much I'd say you need to start if, if, if you're starting a business or you're looking, you need to start surrounding yourself with other business people yeah. and start learning the language. Huge one. I'm a big fan of what are you reading? So I read every single day and I'm not big on fiction. Sure. If I want fiction, I'll watch, I'll watch a movie or something yeah. like that. But I read business books and sales books and financial books. Like one of my favorite books, and I'm such a dork, The History of Taxes. <laughs> okay. But yeah. Doing those things. And I, and I listen to audio books every single day. Like when I go to the gym or long drives. I will put that on because I'm always going, what can I be putting into my brain? But surrounding myself with other business people and not just people that do what I do. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people like, yes, you can learn certain very specific things from people that do what you do. But I love business people in general because I learn as much from my plumbing clients as I do from my hairdresser clients, as I do from my coach clients, as I do from my retail client. Like, yeah. The cross, the cross pollination, and and the ideas, and the other really big one, you have to have a business nine one one number. Okay. So, what is a business nine one one number? It's for when you are having the bad days, and we all do. I still have bad days after twenty years. It's like, oh my god, there's so much work involved, yeah. and like I'm insane. Why don't I just go get myself a nice, safe, secure job, and then I wouldn't have to worry about this? Yeah. So, you have a business nine one one number that is somebody that is safe for you to call. And the first thing, do you have a couple moments I need to vent? <laughs> sure. And then you can just bloop, safely dump it all out. And they, yeah. they listen to you and if they help you work your way through it, but they remind you why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. And they they give you a big hug, swat you on the butt and put you back into the arena to In keep the game. playing the game. Yeah, that's that's so good. So where can people find you online and like learn more about you? The best place to find me is my website. So that's ksabusiness.ca and KSA stands for kick some ass yep. or on Instagram, which is ksa.business. Okay, awesome. And I will have those links on, on the bio for the podcast and, and everywhere on the website. So I can't thank you enough. You know, Tammy, it's been, it's been an awesome to learn more about you, talk to you, get to know you a little bit better. And, and see everything that you're doing in the entrepreneur space. So thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. It was a fun conversation. Absolutely, guys. Thank you so much for checking out The Journey of Business. We'll see you next week with another incredible guest talking about their journey. To continue your journey of business, subscribe to the show wherever you find podcasts or at YouTube. And for more information on consulting inquiries, go to www.tradelinksales.com.